Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the second talk. Um, actually, I found out about the talk yesterday, so I hope you'll enjoy what I prepared for you. Um, the talk is called New Perspective in Web Design, and there is a good reason for that, because actually, originally, it was supposed to be responsive design, clever tips and tricks. Can you hear me? OK, yeah. Um, originally, it was called responsive design, clever tips and tricks. But to be honest, personally, I think that today web design, responsive design is web design. So there is no point to actually call names. And it's perfectly enough to just refer to responsive web design as web design. So this is why a different uh, topic. Some of you might have seen me today. I'm Vitaly, um, the co-founder of Smashing Mac and editor-in-chief. And um, some of you might have seen the site as well. Right? So I'm I'm not going to talk about it today, of course. This talk is about new techniques and really, really exciting stuff. I mean, how many of you are actually doing responsive design today in your project, like by default? You're good people, good people. OK, so how many of you do not do responsive design by default? Well, you don't count. OK, we need to talk why. I'm really curious to find out why. Because there is no reason not to, to be honest. But that's OK. So this talk is not about, I'm not interested in you know, flat designs, schemorphisms, this kind of thing. I'm interested in what works and doesn't work in real life. So for me, it's more about what people out there are doing, what companies out there are doing, what developers very much like us right, are doing out there. So this talk is more about techniques, but also UX patterns, not necessarily techniques on a technical level, right, but also UX design-wise and what actually works in real life, right? You can talk a lot about theory, but theory doesn't count as long as you can't use it in practice. So most of us, I guess, when we think about the web, this is probably the image you have in your mind, right? The web lives in a Chrome. Not necessarily in Chrome as a web browser, right? But in a Chrome, right? Or maybe for us as designers and developers, it looks more like that. Right? And it's our job to actually you know, move these boxes around to make sure that design, design and layout works fine. Right? Do you see the web this way? In your web developer toolbar every single day, damn day? Right? Yes? You have to talk to me. I'm sorry. Right? So we have all these boxes, and our job is to make sure that they align properly. Right? This is what layout does. And when it comes to responsive design, maybe this is the image that we have in our heads. Right? If somebody asks you about responsive design, this is probably something that you have in your mind right away, right? I can, you know, I can walk around the stage all day long. You have to talk to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like you. Yeah, I like you, right? So this is the image we have. But maybe this is not quite what it's supposed to be. I really like this quote by Tim Brown who said that designing for the web is like visualizing a tesseract. It's a complex hypercube. We build experiences by manipulating the shadows. Ooh, shadows, right? <laughs> but I really like this idea of actually thinking about how we design for the web this way. Because if you think about it, maybe this is what we're doing every single day, right? We have this immense, immense complexity out there. We can't predict stuff. There are so many variables, and our job is to kind of make sure that the plot that we create, all these dots and this entirely complex complexity, that they kind of align properly, that they make sense, right? So what we do with every CSS rule that we write is actually putting the dot in this complex figure right here, right? So this is how I see web design today. So it's for me, again, responsive design is just a tool. It's one of the techniques that we can use. But it's a very good and powerful tool that, would enable, that enables us to kind of cope with this multidimensional web that we have today, right? But more importantly, it's not just a technique. It's really a new mindset that changes everything. And it can be scary, and it is, but it changes everything from the beginning to the very end. So no wonder that many clients think that this is true, right? Do you have clients coming to you and asking, well, please do that and please do that, but 
not responsive because responsive is expensive, right? So this is kind of the, uh, the idea that most clients have. And more surprisingly, this is why they move away from responsive design towards more native approaches, right? And then you have stuff like that where uh, Greg Hoy wrote, the CNN IRS app is so bad, I took the unprecedented steps of deleting it and reinstalling it just so I could delete it again, right? Right, so sometimes we move away from responsive design towards native apps just because it's kind of responsive design is hard, but it's not a good excuse to not do responsive design. And as Elliot said in his article um, on his blog a couple of months ago, yes, responsive design is hard, but it's hard in the beginning. And if you've been on the web for a while, and most of you have been on the web for a while, right, as we noticed today, <laughs> Um, you know how this works. Move from tables to CSS was hard, wasn't it? It was hard. Move from fixed layouts to fluid layouts was hard as well. And now we have this move from fluid layout to responsive design, which is kind of hard, but not as hard as move from tables to CSS was. So what he said is, if you're used to designing fixed width layout, it's going to be really, really hard to get your head around designing and building in fluid way first. But once you kind of have the system in your head, once you have an approach and you know how to start and where to go and how to do, what to do in between, you'll be fine. If you have a system in your head, it doesn't matter if it's design, web design or anything else, right? You will be able to make solid design decisions and build responsively without uh, take, uh, it taking too much time. So let's take a look at some techniques that will hopefully help you in the next responsive design project. Resolution independence, right? We have all these wonderful devices, the new iPad, and probably we'll soon have the new, new iPad, and maybe after that, the new, new, new iPad, right? And all the wonderful Samsung devices with high resolution, and we kind of have to cope with it, right? And we can't just keep creating new uh, graphics and new versions of graphics for every single device, for, of, for every single device range, right? It's just not future-proof. So, of course, there are two options that we can use for illustrations and photos. The one is SVG, the other one is icon fonts. So, how many of you are using SVG today? Icon fonts? Both? Neither? Okay, we need to talk. Okay? <laughs> there is no reason not to use SVG or icon fonts today. So, because we know, like, we know PNG sprites, right? Because we're old people, we know what PNG sprites are. PNG, we have a wonderful sprite on the top. And essentially, what we do, we're just using background position property to just put the image, um, the appropriate image, on the site, right, on the page. Well, this is easy. But we can actually do the same with SVG, right, to make sure that we have a scalable icons. So essentially, we'd have a similar uh, markup, right? We also have the unordered list, and we have a list item. What we do is the only thing we have to do, we have to define the background size property. It gives the infinite canvas that we have in SVG a proper size, right? We can convert pixels to EMs easily by dividing by 16 pixels, just because it's a baseline, right, in our cell sheets. So essentially, we can convert from pixels to EMs very easily. So this is easy. And we can still use background position as well, right? So move from pixels to SV uh, from, sorry, from PNG to SVG is really easy. It's not hard. But how, how many of you are actually enjoying the wonderful beauty of maintaining and creating sprites? Who actually likes creating CSS sprites? OK, who doesn't like creating CSS sprites? OK. You are, I, love, I love you guys, really. You're a good audience. So wouldn't it be nicer to use text instead? We can use text in SVG, because SVG is a markup language. So here is the idea. What we can do is, okay, we can create an SVG stack. We start with the bottom, we have an empty file, right? On top of it, we're just writing a markup, group element with an ID chart, right? On top of it, we also write group element with an ID plus, and other elements if we want to use them, right? So what we do in, in SVG, we define the CSS rule, saying that we do not display icons by default, but we're displaying icons in line on target, okay? So what we can do in CSS then, we can just say, okay, background image, 
URL, we, we refer to this SVG file, then we're using hashtag to target the element that we want to have. And on magic magic, it works. No reaction at all? <laughs> so this is pretty cool. Just imagine updating this like that, right? Very easy. Make sense? Makes sense. So if you, are, if you don't want to write your SVG stacks on your own, you can use the SVG stacker that will generate the whole thing for you, right? There are some bugs in Firefox, <laughs> and there's been um, some discussion about the syntax, but this will be doable very soon. It actually, it's doable today if you want to use polyfills as well. But, well, scalable, it's not good enough. Like, okay, we can make sure that the icons are scalable, then even if we have high resolution density displays, they will work. But wouldn't it be better to have more, oops, sorry, let me show you something, to approach it actually responsibly? So let's say we have a window, right? Shouldn't the icon actually change depending on the resolution you have? So that on a smaller screen, because you don't have a lot of space, you don't have a lot of space for a lot of details, the icon should adjust itself as well, right? We can easily do it using background, position, uh, background property, right? So this makes perfect sense, right? But we can do much more with SVG. Do you like image maps? What? <laughs> How can you not like image maps? At some point in your life, a client must have come to you and say, you know what, we want to have a map on the website, we want to have distributed centers or offices, and we want people to be able to click on them, right? So you have to draw a map, and then you have to create the HTML image map. It's dirty like hell, right? And nobody likes it. But we can have a very clean, very clean approach. We can do the same very, in a very clean way using SVG. Essentially, with SVG, we have different paths. So you can make this path clickable, and we can create all kinds of hub effects on this path using just path hover, right? It's very, very easy to do, and it's a good, good replacement for image maps. So if a client comes to you and wants to have an image map, and say, right here, I can do the cleanest and the most beautiful image map you've ever seen, which is probably true, right? You want to embed an actual bitmap in your image map? Sure. What you do is you create an image, a bitmap. You have a background image as well. And then what you do in Illustrator or Sketch, you just create a vector mask and then export it with SVG. And then you can create, make this vector mask scalable. You scale it 100%. So whenever the browser is resized, it remains clickable. It's a scalable image map. How cool is that? I mean, this is pretty, pretty cool, actually. But it's not enough, right? Now, now that we're talking about SVG, we have to do some cool shit. Uh, stuff, sorry. <clears throat> so, why don't we do animated checkboxes? Because everybody has to do animated checkboxes, right? No, wait a second. Let me... Ah, damn it. Yes. So, let's say we have checkboxes. Usually, we have radio buttons input elements, this kind of stuff. So what about something like this? Or this? Or maybe this? Or maybe even this, right? And the idea here is very easy, very simple. We do need JavaScript to activate SVG file. But essentially, if, so if users don't have SVG support, or JavaScript support, they don't they see the regular, regular you know, checkboxes. But if they do have SVG support, you can add all kinds of animations to it. Which is pretty cool actually. Right? We just need to define an SVG file. So there is a lot, a lot that can be done with SVG. And there is a library called nsnap SVG, which came out just recently, which is really, really powerful and amazing. Essentially you can think about it as jQuery for JavaScript. Right? Uh, sorry, uh, S Snap SVG is for SVG like jQuery is for JavaScript, which is quite amazing. But okay, I'm too excited about SVG, I know that. SVG is cool though, right? Um, we have a good support for SVG, but you know, except you know who, right? 
Um, and for legacy browsers, we do need a PNG fallback, but there are three, two really clever tricks to make it work um, for PNG fallback. As we know, all browsers that support SVG background images also support multiple background images. So you can use these two lines of code over in the top in the middle here, saying, okay, normal background, we provide a PNG file, and for browsers who support both backgrounds, multiple backgrounds, we provide a SVG file. So, so our good old friend, our bad old friend, old friend A8, A8, A8 will get the, we'll get the PNG, file. PNG file. It's a good browser, so we'll, we'll get the SVG file. The SVG file. And if it's and two lines, two lines of code much for, much for you, well, why, well, why just stick just to one, to one line of code? So we have, so this, we have file, this file, this, this uh, sample, sample SVG1, SVG1, which essentially says, okay, 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 if I'm an old browser, I don't understand this G2G type, right? So I do this, okay, I see SVG, we know, I don't understand this. I skip it, skip it, I see image, oh. We just like, we just like GMG, normal, normal, HTML, 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 we can use iconic fonts as well, as well. And, we can, and we can really clever stuff with iconic fonts. So we know so how it works, right? right? We have this we have wonderful, this wonderful bullet 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 font face syntax. It's kind of scary, scary like hell, like but, but, but it works, it works. Right? right? And what we do, we, we have, have our markup, then we just pick, define the font family, then you are using a full the class to induce a content property to just grab the glyph from the font and then display it, right? We can actually we can kind of minimize, minimize, the, code minimize the code as well using HTML5 HTML data, data, data attributes, data ID in this case. Yes. And the only thing we do is, well, we define the content property here in CSS using Atom, right? And this is easy, right? So if you have an icon font, this is very easy to do, and the support is really very good. But we want to be better than this. We can do much more with this. So here's an idea. This is so cool. So here's the idea. We split apart the components of a, of a vector, of a complex icon, and stack each element on top of each other to generate icons on the fly. So what it means is, let's say we have a cloud icon, okay, uh, in the font. We have a cloud icon, we have a sun icon, okay? We can apply CSS to the cloud, add a gradient to it. We can do the same for the sun. Maybe we can add drop shadow or whatever. And then we can generate it like a stack dynamically. So we don't have to create this icon, actually, because it can be generated on the fly, right? Make sense? Right? So the code is kind of, right? But it works, and you can do lots of stuff with it. You can actually add shadows to it, background images, whatever you want to do. But what it means is, and what's really cool about this, you can create just atomic units for your icons, then generate the rest on the fly, which is quite cool. So there are many, many comprehensive web fonts available. We can use awesome, uh, what's called uh, font awesome or n typo. They're massive, right? Uh, they have all the icons you probably need. The support is everywhere but Opera Mini, but Opera Mini doesn't support anything anyway, right? And Android 2.1, right? So it's better, the support is better than, on, than for SVG. And we can also build custom the small, smallest bundles with Fontello. Where essentially you can go, and they have all the open source fonts available for you. You can just grab an element that you like and then generate everything right away for you, including the fallback and everything. But you can pick only the icons you like and then bundle them together, which is really nice. Or you can use Icomoon, where you can actually also draw your own icons, which is pretty cool too. But it's not good enough, right? Because, you know, if you want to generate your icon fonts or SVG files, so you go to Sketch or Illustrator, you draw, and then you have to export, then you have to generate a fallback, then you have to load the browser, you have to load the page in the browser, you have to scale it to see how it works. It's, wouldn't it be nice if you could just say, hey, I change one pixel in my Sketch application or Illustrator or whatever, and everything is generated right away on the fly, and you can preview it in all browsers of your choice like that. Simultaneously. Yes. So this poor guy uses seven or eight 
terminal tools, right, to make it work. So the moment he actually changes a pixel in his um, sketch application, it's all generated on the fly, the backup is generated, the CSS is generated, it's all uh, copied in the folder of his choice, and it's live reloaded in the browser of his choice. This is just awesome, right? It's just amazing. But we can go further than that, right? It's, it's good, but we can go further than that. So what about having mobile devices being synced to your browser, to this live reloader, so that even if you change it in your Illustrator or whatever, it should be displayed everywhere, right? On your mobile devices as well. And you can also be able to define the browsers that you want it to be displayed in. So browser sync allows you essentially to inject CSS code dynamically and live reload it everywhere. So it's just amazing, right? It's just amazing. Please check it out. So images. Okay, so we essentially the whole thing with illustration, responsive illustrations and icons is solved. That's easy. Photos, not so much, right? So what do we do with images? Because, you know, responsive images, that's a big topic, right? So here's the deal. In order to display high pixel density, uh, to display photos properly on high pixel density displays, we don't really need high resolution images. Do you believe me? No, shaky, okay. Well, you are smart people, so maybe you've heard of it. But it's a quite smart technique. So the idea is, given two identical images that are displayed at the same size on the website, one can be dramatically smaller than the other one in file size if it's highly compressed and dramatically larger in dimension than it is displayed in. So here's what it means. Let's say we have this image that is 600 times 400 pixels natively, right? It has the worst JPEG quality you can get, right? It's displayed in 600 times 400, and its file size is 7K. If you reduce it in the display, and you say, let's display it in 300 times 200, it still has the same file size, obviously, but most people will not be able to notice a difference between this image and that image. And that image was created as 300 times 200 natively, was compressed with a relatively good JPEG compression, so it's not too bad, but it's not too good, right? It's the same dimensions, but that one is 7K and that one is 21K. So, of course, you can't use it everywhere. You can't just go and blow up your images like that for all the images you have on your site. But if you don't have many images, it might actually work well. So this poor guy from the Netherlands, he tested it all on all the different devices and to see what, you know, because obviously the browser has to resize the images. And it does work. There are no noticeable um, decrease, there is no noticeable decrease in performance, right? Poor guy, but he's a good smart kid. So, but the thing is, maybe we care about all these wonderful high resolution images way too much. I mean, do you really care if this image is 8K or 46K, if it's displayed in a high density or not? Personally, on the left side, the one on the left side, for me, it's 8K too much. Because I really, I, there is no point for me, of, for me you know, seeing this image at all. So maybe we're thinking a bit too much about uh, optimizing images and stuff. And you know, there are, of course, two kinds of images. There are progressive JPEGs and baseline JPEGs. You know, progressive JPEGs, which are kind of, how do I explain it? Explain it. They kind of appear first, and then the quality gets better over time. Then you have the Right? It sounded weird. Okay. Um, so, of course, it's kind of better to, s to show the image in the worst quality first, at least so that the user can actually see the image, and then uh, to make sure that the quality gets better over time. So, progressive JPEGs kind of become a new best practice. And when it comes to this retina optimized images, it's solved, it's done. There is no point, you know, there is no magic behind it. Um, there is a chart that you can use if you want to make sure that you deliver images to retina, retina images to retina devices. That's easy. The only thing is, the only problem is you have to, well, you have to define background images for your retina images. You can't use just image tag due to performance. 
right? But this is done. This is easy. You can check it out if you want to. And of course, the most the best way to do is, of course, just to go ahead and optimize using tiny PNG from PNG files and JPEG mini few JPEG files. But wouldn't it be nice? to have a folder of files, or let's say to have a folder where you could just put your images in, be it JPEG, PNG, GIFs, or whatever it is, and then just have a tool that would actually run through all the images and optimize them losslessly and output them in a, in a folder that you like to have with the naming you are, you'd like to have. So this is what you can do with image optim comment line. Comment line is awesome, by the way, right? It's very cool. Well, Okay, so we can kind of, we know how to optimize images, but especially if you're working on localized interfaces or interfaces where or websites that actually have to support many different languages, it might be a bit difficult to actually test the sites or test how they behave responsively because you kind of have two dimensions, as we said in the beginning. At one dimension, you have the wording, right? And at the same time, you have the layout changes. So it might be difficult. So BBC has come up with this tool called Wraith, and the idea there is they let you, I can, so you can make a picture. Brilliant. So the idea here is you can let this race tool actually run on any, on every localized interface, or every localized site. And then what they do is they run the merge and the diff of images. So that if you have that something is wrong, or maybe because the text was so long in this navigation, for example, in navigation, you can see that something is different. Maybe the layout is significantly different. So this tool actually runs through all these different localized interfaces, and what it output outputs is this directory of files, right? With all the different divs, but also all the different screenshots for every localized interface, which is quite useful. But of course, we, what we want to have is this. Well, not the dog, but we want to have to be able to deliver different images to different devices. And we can't do that. So there is no magic trick for that, right? We just can't do it yet. The only thing we can do is we can use picture fill, which most of you probably use already, um, to make sure that we do not deliver assets that our users don't need, right? And deliver only assets that they actually need. So the markup is kind of eh, you know, but it works. Or we can actually use Tyson Metting's branch of it if you want to go more to have a more granular control about when things are loaded and when not, which allows you to load before the images before the entire DOM has loaded or after the rest of the page loads. It gives you just more granular control about how and when and when not the images are loaded. Right? Um, he also wrote this wonderful, wonderful article explaining the whole thing. It has six comments. It's brilliant and it has just six comments. It's really cool. So, responsive images is actually the most complex issue that we have today to solve. Most responsive design problems are solved, it's done. Images, big deal. So, BBC considers that for every image, responsive image solution, we have to consider two steps. The first one is creating multiple versions of the same image, and the second one, deciding which image to use, right? So, they're crazy. Because what they do is, whoa, okay, so they automatically create 18 versions for each image. 18 versions for each image. So they have an image chef, which sits between the CMS and the static image server, right? Image variations are defined, and the metadata is provided by editors based on instructions in the CMS. So Azure actually defines which images are going to be loaded and when, and what, in what resolutions, uh, and so on. They also have a consistent image scheme, URL scheme, to maintain the whole thing. It's extremely complex, of course. And they manipulate the DOM on load with JavaScript. So essentially, by default, this is what's being loaded on BBC. Like this div, this empty div. And then once they discover that JavaScript is available, they're loading more stuff, using this iChef, and here you can see 235, right? It's essentially a marker saying that the images that are sitting in this, in this folder have the width of 235 pixels, right? And this for every, for 18 resolutions. Crazy, right? But it does work for them. So what they do then is, 
It's a defect detect that the browser is capable of actually loading stuff with JavaScript. Then JavaScript checks the width of each image and of the viewport, right? It sets URLs right, using regular expressions, for example, converts divs into images, and then they also add a resize event under the window object. Well, if you have lots of time, or you, know, you have no hobbies, maybe this is an option for you as well, right? <laughs> because it's really crazy. But BBC, they have to do it, right? But this just shows how complex the whole thing is. It is doable. You can, you can make it work. It's just very complex. But BBC has open sourced the whole thing for you. So if you want to use it, or maybe a simplified version of it, you can use it today as well, right? Well, if you do not have a hobby, you can try this, the clown car technique. Um, and it kind of works, just a bit hacky. So we can use media queries within SVG. Ah, oh, SVG. We can use media queries within SVG to serve right raster images using this simple markup. Now, this is the simplest markup you can have for responsive images. You have image source, image SVG, right? This is easy. The magic happens in the SVG file. So there we have a group element. Then we have four images, small, medium, big, and huge, right? And we are linking to them using Xlink. Well, essentially, it's SVG um, markup for um, image, right? For source element, sorry. Well, we can use display none in SVG, but again, you know, display none is bad because of performance, right? Right? Yes. So it's better to use background image, of course. So you could say, well, we can do the same with normal CSS. Why do we need to go into SVG for that? Right? I lost you already, haven't I? OK. Well, the point is, and I think it's very, very important, there are two main benefits of using this. Well, actually, we do need the object tag instead of SVG. But, you know. But there are two main benefits. The first one, the media queries within SVG are based on the parent element in which the SVG is contained, not the viewport width. And this is a big, big deal. Because imagine, you say, let's say you have, this is a problem that we're running into right now. Let's say you have an element in the sidebar, and then you want to move it away from the sidebar, let's say, under the main content area. If you have a media query referring to the viewport, you have to rewrite your media query. But if this element would refer to its parent element instead, its size and dimensions and colors and whatever you want to have could kind of adjust itself dynamically. So having that would be really, really cool. We're just not quite there yet, right? But it's really massively, it can be massively, massively helpful. And also, it's kind of neat to see that all images are encapsulated in this one SVG file, right? So if you want to adjust your images, well, you can just adjust the SVG file. That's pretty cool. So you can play around with the technique. It's kind of hacky. It does work, right? So media queries are the next big thing, I think. So this is actually this whole thing idea of media queries referring to the parent element. If you want to use it, and if you're not scared of reliance on JavaScript, you can actually use it today because it's also open sourced. So this element media queries is available, I available as JavaScript today. How much time do I have, actually? I keep going. OK. You just drag me out of here whenever you want to. I don't mind. Because we have to talk about responsive emails at some point. OK. So, but first, let's talk about conditional loading. Performance is a big deal. We know that already. And essentially, if you think about responsive design, what we're trying to do with all these wonderful techniques is a state-of-the-art progressive enhancement with a very strong focus on performance, right? Very strong focus on performance. We don't want to deliver assets to devices that can't read, can't use them, for example. We don't want to deliver too many assets to devices that don't want, uh, no, to, to devices that are not capable of showing them all. So well, let's look at what the Guardian does. So they consider that they have kind of three types of page content. They have core content which is essentially just HTML and CSS, right? And they consider it to be a usable, non-JavaScript-enhanced experience. They have enhancement, which is JavaScript, 
geolocation, touch, enhanced CSS, web fonts are considered to be enhancement, right? And leftovers. You know, stuff that nobody actually needs. Analytics, advertising, third-party contents, weather application, whatever, right? This kind of stuff. Now, where do you think images are here? Are they, who thinks that images are core content? Who thinks that images are enhancement? Think that images are leftovers? Okay. So, in fact, images are in enhancement. And the idea is to load the core content first, then they're loading enhancement and DOM content ready, and leftovers on load. So, the content is available right away because it doesn't have any images, right? HTML and CSS, the content is right there. And then images are loaded on DOM content ready, and the rest on load event, right? And you can say, well, we don't have to you know, care about this JavaScript. Who doesn't have JavaScript these days, right? Now, the problem is, especially if you're on a mobile device, most users do not have, actually, all users do not have your JavaScript support while they're downloading your JavaScript. So if you, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to download jQuery library, and you know that. It takes a lot of time still to download a Zepto library, although it's smaller, right? But then also JavaScript has to be executed, has to be applied, right? So it does take time. So many users don't have JavaScript while they're downloading your JavaScript. And this is a big deal. And this is why progressive enhancement is so important, right? Because even if JavaScript doesn't load, for some reason, we kind of, we've had, we had our back. So we are safe. So progressive enhancement is good. This is why they're using it as well. So this is the view they get if no JavaScript is supported. Still content. Right? Basic HTML, basic CSS, but of course the image is kind of, they're not using the image tag, obviously, because of the performance issues. So they're using data attributes, and they're loading images uh, as an extra, as an enhancement. But you can say, well, okay, we can use async and defer to just make sure that scripts are loaded asynchronously, so have huge performance boosts, of course, but what they do is, they have this wonderful function is modern browser, right? And only if they detect a modern browser, very much like BBC, right? Only then they're loading the enhanced JavaScript. Now, what is this mystical is modern browser function? Well, you can kind of try to separate browsers into groups using server-side detection, user agent strings and things like Wurfle and Device Atlas, this kind of thing. You probably know what I'm talking about, but it's kind of dirty, it doesn't always work. It's kind of, you have to maintain this library, it's no fun, right? So it would be kind of nicer to have a nice client-side detection. So what they do is, what they do is, they're using these three lines of code to separate browsers into two groups, HTML5 browsers and HTML4 browsers, like the new ones and the old ones, right? So they check if query selectors in document, the check is if local storage is available in window, and the check if edit event listener is in the window as well. And once it's the case, well, then they detect, okay, it's an HTML5 browser, right? Essentially, what we have right here is a really short replacement for modernizer in many cases. Because in many cases, this is what you need, right? So it's really, really nice. And of course, what they also use is actually include pattern, where essentially fragments of HTML or actually content on your site are, are downloaded and executed only on demand when place, space is available. So that by default, for example, in this case, you can load a really small icon with really small uh, amount of data, right? And then they have this expanded Ajax enhanced state, which is loaded only if you have enough screen and only if you have um, a JavaScript support, which is fine, right? So, Ajax include pattern is pretty, pretty cool, right? Well, it's not good enough, of course. We can do more than that. So, Gmail does something dirty, and if you had tomatoes, you would have thrown at me, them at me right away, because it's not cool what they do, but it works in terms of performance. So, here's the idea. Let browsers download all the JavaScript right away, but evaluate it on demand, only when users need it, right? So that much of the code is commented out, and when needed, uncommented and evaluated. Ooh, I got a negative vibe in here, right? 
So in Gmail's case, they were able to reduce the page load from 2,600 milliseconds to 240 milliseconds. I'm sorry, guys, but if it works for Google, I'm sorry, right? It's a big, big improvement. So the code is very much like what you think, right? You have this lazy script on the top, and of course we have to strip out all the comments first. <laughs> kind of makes sense, right? Um, and then what they have is, well, they have this HTML element. Then on click, they have a lo the loading the lazy load function. Essentially gets this element, looks into its HTML, and strips out the comments, and then, ah, right? Evil is evil, right? Yes? Hmm. Well, they wrote about this in 2009, I guess, 2009, and they're still using it. So there must be a good reason for that. And, hmm, just saying, okay, I'm not a JavaScript junkie, but I'm just saying maybe sometimes we should be using, consider using uh, eval as well. But okay, so this is kind of done. But we know, you know, performance of buttons. Who likes Facebook buttons? Oh, Facebook button. <laughs> Facebook buttons. Um, everybody, no, I don't know any performance person, performance person, uh, anybody who cares about performance who really likes the performance of any social button, right? So what if we load these widgets only when users explicitly choose to take that action to like something or to recommend something or tweet about something? So we load small social icons by default and then Facebook, Twitter and whatever and click. Because this is actually what keeps me awake at night, right? Facebook button waits 120k and produces four HTTP requests. Oh, this is so bad. This is so nasty. It's bad. It's not okay. It's totally not okay. So Heise is using it, and you probably have seen it before, and the kind of more and more sites are starting using it when by default the images are just icons. It's just icons, PNG or SVG icons. Then when you click on it, on them, you have a JavaScript running, and then the whole widget is preloaded. Right? So it's available as a jQuery plugin. I don't know why we need jQuery for that, to be honest. Social count is a bit better a plugin because it's, um, it's a bit more performant, which is nice. So now let's talk. Oh, this is so nasty. It's unbelievable. So how many of you have experimented with responsive newsletters before? OK. Do you enjoy it? Yes. You're weird, okay. I template. Template, okay. <laughs> Templates are no cool. So, but responsive newsletters are a big deal. My problem with responsive newsletters is when I think about them, I think about this. <laughs> it's like going back in time, in those wonderful, wonderful times when Internet Explorer 6 came out. And if you're kind of starting missing Internet Explorer 6 now, because you have so many good browsers today, and we don't really have to care about IE 6 anymore, we do have to care about IE 7 and 8 sometimes. Well, usually about 8. eight. But if you really want to go back in time and enjoy the beauty of coding for IE 6, I have something just for you, right? Welcome to responsive newsletters. Because you probably have seen this before. You open an email in your on your mobile phone, and you see something like that. And what is the first thing you do? You hit the delete button, right? This is what most people do. You get an email that is not readable and looks weird, and it has this tiny size and this huge layout, which is not displayable on a mobile device, and you just hit the delete button. And the problem is mobile email is big, right? Oh, I didn't expect that. Mobile email is big. So of course we have good email clients and bad email clients, right? So iPhone is quite popular. Outlook, still very popular. iPad, Android, Apple Mail, Outlook.com, Yahoo, and Gmail. They're kind of the most important ones. And the interesting thing is that many of them actually support media queries. Not all of them, but many of them. So for example, we have Android 2.1, but you know, Android 2.1. Uh, BlackBerry, but you know, BlackBerry, right? <laughs> Microsoft Windows Mobile, but you know, you know how it goes, right? But we also have Google Mail doing essentially what they want to do. At some point, they actually supported media queries for three days or so, 
which was interesting, and then I decided to not support it anymore. So, but you know that anyway, if you send out an email, um, a newsletter to Gmail people, people are using Gmail, they always look kind of weird, right? But it's Gmail. So the problem is essentially Microsoft Outlook, Gmail everywhere, and Yahoo everywhere, right? So the biggest culprits. But the problem is that the mobile email is really big, right? So 47% of email opens happen on mobile today. Every second email is opened on mobile. So we have to make sure that the email looks good on mobile device, right? And it's more than desktop clients and webmail, right? So it's a very big deal. Only 12% of high-impact newsletters are responsive. 12%, right? And 80% of people receiving emails that are not readable delete them right away, right? So there is no chance of people actually reading this at all, right? And because most newsletters are broken, and you have the zoom and pitching experience, which nobody likes, right? We have a big advantage. If you produce responsive newsletters, your boss will love you, right? Because it's, it's a big business advantage against competitors. So it's very fragile medium, medium as we know, and it has very strange constraints and requirements. Usually we can't do more than, you know, stick to 500 to 600 pixels for the layout. Oops, sorry. Uh, we have to make sure that the icons and links are clickable, so we have to stick within this 45 times 45 pixels, right, for fat, button, for fat fingers. Minimum font size is 13 pixels, which means if your users, actually on the iPhone, it doesn't matter what font size you define, if you define 12 pixels, it will still be displayed in 13 pixels. It's a minimum on iPhone, at least, right? You thought that doc type is supported? Most email clients don't support doc type at all. They just ignore it and replace it with the ones they kind of pre that is pre-written or hard-coded, which is terrible, right? But it's just how things are. So there is no doc support, of course. And often images are disabled, right? And there is no way around tables, <laughs> pixels, and display none, right? So this is like the worst you can get today. It doesn't get worse than that, really. So Intel Explorer six times, here you go, right? And the culprits are Outlook, Lotus Notes, still being used today, Yahoo and Gmail. But, you know, we can do stuff with it still. So what about content stacking? Let's say we have a four columns in desktop layout. We want to bring them down to two stacked under each other, each other right? So essentially what we have is we have table, right? Of course, we have a table. Oh, I can't believe I have it in my slides. It's so terrible. Uh, okay, we have a table for layouts. And what we have is two columns. Each is 300 widths, right? And then what we do is we just display them in block from table cell to block. What it means is they have to you know, float. And we can use this media query to make it work. So this is really easy, right? We just display them block. And this is what we have to do most of the time. We want to have column switching so that we have on the small screen, we have this person, and then we have a text under it. Then we have on the larger screen, we could have a text and a button and the person on the right. Well, we have a sub-column and a main column, each 300 pixels width, right? right? Now what we do is, I just define, you know, the wonderful table header, table footer, this kind of stuff, these properties, you know them? Ooh, right? But it works, right? So what we do is we do the same with the display block for table elements, and then we just display header, footer, and we can use caption and this kind of thing, right, in tables. I don't like the expression on your faces. You don't like it? It works, right? So you want to have an image shifter pattern, right? So you have on a small screen, you have a small image, but on the right, which is kind of floated, and on the, on the bigger screen, you want to have a big prominent image, and then the rest kind of floated on the right. Well, you can do it as well. You have your wonderful TDs for the image, and then for content, and you have header and description in it. And what you do is, well, you, floating is kind of hacky. It doesn't quite work in Outlook, but it's doable. And then you do display block, and you just clear use clear both to push it all under the image, right? It's very simple, but you know. If you want to reorder stuff, you can do it as well. 
using very similar techniques, table header, table footer, table caption. Unfortunately, there is no table header group two or something. So you could define an order, right? So I just want to put aside lots of text on it, but just a couple of tips. So Yahoo Mail doesn't care what you do. Um, so if you're not using attribute selectors, it will just ignore media query, Yahoo, okay? So you have to write this TD class body, but you know it anyway. Outlook displays the mobile version by default, unless you add max device width to max width. Don't ask me why. Um, often it's better to just completely avoid defining doc type. Um, I never thought I'd say that, but it's a good idea to use non-important <laughs> for everything, for everything, because otherwise it might not work. Um, and email resets styles are necessary, but there are good templates you can use today. Like there is a good responsive boilerplate, HTML email boilerplate. <sighs> Works. Um, or you can go to Emoji, which is also which also provides you with some templates. So how much time do I have? Five minutes? One minute? No, no time? None? Sorry? Minus six. Minus six. Yeah. Okay, just one slide then. <laughs> so, okay, I have to decide now. Um, it's so sad, but it's okay. Um, so, fixed positioning. We have it solved, right? It's been a nightmare, and it's really, really hard. And there are so many buggy uh, devices that just do not work properly. But you can use FixSticky now. FixSticky, is, it finally works. It's a JavaScript polyfill, but it does work everywhere. So this is pretty cool. And then, <laughs> no, I don't have stuff for you. No, that's OK. Um, yeah. So how many of you know this? OK. So it's a Voyager, record Voyager, which was sent out into outer space in the 70s. Um, and it contains some information about humanity, and about us, about people, right? And what we do and how we are, what the Earth is like. So it was sent out in the 70s. But I'm, when the first time I saw it, I had two questions popping out in my head. So somebody must have gone to somebody at some point and asked, you know what? We're going to send out a label containing data into outer space and it's going to stay there for eternity, maybe, maybe for centuries, maybe for eternity. It's supposed to be read by aliens, aliens, right? So why don't you design a visual language that would actually contain and explain and um, explore the data about humanity? The designer must have said, sure, I can do it by tomorrow, right? <laughs> so that must have been a very difficult task. But the designer had to come up with some sort of a visual language that would actually make it work, right? So why am I showing it to you? Well, I don't want you to go out and design websites for aliens yet, right? But maybe if we kind of stick to the web as it is today and trying to make the best out of it using responsive design approaches, using the techniques that I showed, maybe some of them are more practical than others, Maybe we can make the web as usable for aliens as it will be for humans, right? So let's do the best out of it. We've got books. Thank you. <laughs> Here you go.